Hey guys, I am so excited that although I was out of town, I think my sister was here and then I was out of town or my sister had left, did one and then I was out of town, but I am back for our usual Monday um, study. And the reason I'm excited is, you know, if some of you heard that one uh, night where I was frustrated because I couldn't seem to, you know, get my plan, get it to where it was always set and that's what I did for our studies. Here I am. Look at me go. Uh, now, if you notice, which I don't know if you can tell, but if you notice a knot right here that might be a little large, I don't know if you can see it, and yellow, um, you're not seeing things. I ran into a barbell when I was training with my son in DC. That was after ripping off half of my fingernail at the airport. My son was a little bit nervous taking me out in public wanted to keep me away from curbs and things of that nature, but I made it back safe and sound. I'm excited to dive into the topic of the bride. Uh, the last time we studied, we looked into the fact that um, the enemy would be paroled after a thousand years, and in spite of the Lord ruling and reigning in physical you know, presence, I don't know, this is this is ridiculous. I don't know what his problem is, but he's like, anyway, um, he found people that would join him to make war against um, the Lord and us and the nations. And he was then um, soundly defeated and put in the lake of fire. <laughs> okay. So the reason he's smelling me is I've been doing yard work all day and you may see this huge bandaid as well when I'm talking and so he's, smell, he's smelling the outdoors. This is ridiculous. My apologies. So the enemy is destroyed, thrown in the lake of fire. And then we also learn that uh, to keep those that do not have their resurrected bodies, are not part of the first resurrection, to make sure that they don't um, mess up. Th they can go and actually see the lake of fire physically as a reminder. Um, now... I do want to, because I'm not sure if I covered this the last time, in Revelation 20, 11 through 15, it says, I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it. The earth and sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne, and the books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead. And death and the grave gave up their dead, and all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is a second death, and anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So I do think I did um, teach on that a little bit, but I just wanted to make sure that we understand that we are blessed to be part of the first resurrection, which is us, if we're alive, taking on our immortal body. If we're dead, we're resurrected. Versus this final um, resurrection where these people are being resurrected and appointed to death. So now we've got all of that out of the way. The effect of the fall has been reversed. The earth is restored. And um, now it's time for the bride. Okay, so we're going to read uh, Revelation 21, 1 through 4. It says, then I saw a new heaven and new earth for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. So the word heaven here is Uranos and it means um, it's actually the root word for the uh, planet Uranus. Uh, but it also it's often used in the plural to de to, no to denote the sky and the regions above the earth, the dwelling place of God, Christ, and angels, and then, of course, resurrected saints. And then the word beautifully dressed for her husband is a word that means to make ready, prepare, make arrangements. In addition to its normal use describing preparation for coming events, the word is used as of the preparation for the Messiah of blessings that God has ordained and of judgment. So then he says, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. 
He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All of these things are gone forever. Hallelujah. Now, the word new here is really important to understand because a lot of people get it confused, and there's uh, some false teaching that has been the result of that in different denominations um, that they say they're Christian, but I'm not sure that they are. I don't want to name uh, names right now. But the word new refers to heaven and earth, which have been renewed, therefore made superior and more splendid. It's the same idea of us being a new creation. So I'm still Sherry uh, when I got born again, but I'm renewed in my spirit where it's made perfect. And then that work continues in my soul um, to where I am being transformed so that my heart looks more and more like his. So I am, and you are, if you're born again, we're actually made more splendid. We're made more superior than we were uh, pre-saved. But also, um, if you look at it, we had an upgrade with Adam and Eve because Adam and Eve, they could walk around the garden and then the Lord's voice would be on the breeze and they could commune with him that way. But he actually lives inside us. So that's um, an upgrade compared to even the beginning. So it's, it's, it's the um, opposite of another word for new, which means new from scratch. So what that means is that the heavens and the earth are not going to be absolutely wiped out. And then God makes a new from scratch heaven and earth. It's he takes the current heavens and he takes the current earth and he renews it and makes it more splendid and superior. It's uh, also, you know, like if you think about it, when you're renovating a house, more than likely, especially with the renovation, you're making it superior. You're making it uh, more splendid. You're upgrading the electric. You're upgrading the, um, the plumbing, the walls, the paint. You're putting in new windows. And then the new splendid comes in, you know, your colors and your carpet and your flooring and the, you know, the outside and you're making it uh, look better than it did originally. That's how my house is. It was originally a, a, a white siding house that I think was only like two bedrooms, uh, maybe one or two bathrooms. And it was quite frankly, ugly. And then uh, a company came in and renovated, added on. It's now superior and it's more splendid than it was before. So that's what this new means when it says a new heaven and new earth. He's not starting from scratch. He's taking what already exists and he's making it better, okay? So I just wanna make sure we understand that. If we look at the parable of the new wineskins, you got two different different words actually that are used for new. Uh, the one is agnophos, and that's one that has not been washed and properly shrunk. And then the second new is kenos, which is the word that's used here in our text. And um, it is another patch, but derived from a cloth that has been washed and shrunk. So it doesn't shrink when used as a patch and then tear the garment. So this type of new um, kenos that's referred to here in our text in Revelation uh, is different from just any neos or new piece of cloth that has not yet been washed and shrunk. In other words, it's not been prepared. So it existed before this idea of new, and it's going to continue to exist, but it's now being prepared for a new purpose. So it's the same thing when you're born again, right? So you still exist, but you now have a new purpose. That's why I'm not a big fan of this, less of me, more of you, God, um, because that was uh, the context for that statement was John the Baptist. And basically what he was saying is, I must decrease. My ministry must decrease so that his ministry can increase. You know, God wants all of you. He doesn't want you to cease to exist. He wants your personality. He wants your strengths. He wants uh, your weaknesses so that he is strong in you. He wants all of those things so that you can live on the level of the highest purpose, the highest quality, what you were made to live like as a person, 
But because we were born as fallen individuals, none of those things could ever show themselves forth in the degree of glory that the Lord would like us to display them. So once you become born again, the more internal work you do, the more renewing of your mind, etc., the more you show forth how he designed you and you're a benefit to those around you. So I hope that makes sense. So um, the heaven and earth will remain. It's going to be made superior and uh, splendid. And the damage of the fallen state of man has disappeared from the earth and the sea. The creatures, small and great, that have longed for this revealing of the sons of God can now enjoy a heaven and earth that is no longer scarred by sin. One of my favorite passages is in Romans 8, 19 through 22, because it says, For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. Now, when it says God's curse, let me make sure you understand. When a judge delivers a sentence of a convicted uh, felon, convicted criminal, he it's considered a curse because uh, it's something that's negative, but it's something that is required for the public. When uh, public safety. So when God said, because of your actions, the earth is now cursed. The, the responsibility lies with Adam. And he was given the authority over the earth. And, and because he listened to the enemy, the earth would no longer yield her bounty easily. Because now the earth is subjected to the fall of man. Okay? So God pronounced a sentence. And the sentence was in response to uh, Adam's... Um, uh, uh, sin. So then it says, but with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Uh, now, I, I just want to say something, you know, when you as a believer own uh, property or if you rent and you take like really good care of the home and really good care of the grounds, that is actually a way that you can relieve some of the curse. Um, we are uh, kingdom people and we're supposed to expand the kingdom in all aspects of life. That includes what God has blessed us with to steward. That's why it's so important to take care of your clothes. It's so important to take care of your yard and your home. It's so important to take care of your car, uh, to be a, a good steward of those things because it is preparation for our future. And it's uh, prepar like if we can't, if we can't wash our dishes, I'm not sure why we would expect God to give us any type of ministry that would be effective, right? If you can't keep your, your clothes clean, if you can't take care of your physical body, if you can't do those things, then I'm not sure why he should trust us with deeper things. Money in particular is one that you have to pass the money test because if you don't pass the money test, he can't give you cities. He can't give you the things that he would like to do, the deeper things, the spiritual things. So how we care for our physical things determines what we get to do for him when it comes to spiritual matters and ministry. And so when you take care of your yard and you have pretties and things like that, you're bringing a little taste of heaven to that place, that space. Okay, let me read this to you. I had forgotten about this um, until this morning because, you know, you've got some people that have the mind that, you know, who cares if you live in a house and you got, you know, a place to sleep, blah, blah. Who cares if it looks nice, et cetera, et cetera. Isn't that a waste? Well, you know, the Lord has streets that are made of gold. So I would think that maybe that's wasteful, but he likes beauty. And so, of course, that's heaven and he has streets of gold, but still he doesn't have to have streets of gold. He can have beautiful rock or beautiful brick, but instead he cho chose one of the most precious metals. God created beauty. Out of him came beauty. And I am a huge proponent of surrounding myself with beauty. I remember when my dad died, um, I would just walk around in the house and I would look at the things, you know, like memories, because anything that's on my walls, there's some type of memory or there's something, you know, special that's tied to it. And I would just be so thankful 
uh, for the environment, you know, not to say I can't succeed in an environment that's not beautiful, but it was very um, helpful to my soul. Uh, same thing in a, a past uh, experience of last year. And um, I forgot, it says um, here in Proverbs, let me see if I can, yeah. Uh, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 30. Eyes that focus on what is beautiful bring joy to the heart. And hearing a good report refreshes and strengthens the inner beings. But eyes that focus what on what is beautiful brings joy to the heart. And so we, um, yeah, the Lord loves beauty and we should make things beautiful wherever we go, you know, make people feel good, have environments where our eyes can rest upon, uh, beauty because creation is longing for the end of this, um, age so that they can want, so that earth and nature can once again come into its fullness of purpose. So at this point, God will be home among his people. He'll never have to leave us like he had to do with Moses and the Israelites or when he had to leave the temple before the Babylonians destroyed it. Um, he's going to live with us like he's always wanted. The end game, the goal of the Lord was always us. And um, and that's a, a stunning thought. So there's not going to be any more sadness or tears or crying or pain. And then it says in the uh, verse 5, and the one sitting on the throne said, look, Pay attention, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, write this down for I tell I, what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, it is finished. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings and I will be their God and they will be my children. Now this phrase is interesting because John is seeing the end of the age complete, right? And then the Lord says, look, I'm making everything new. It's like he summed up for John what John was seeing. The scrolls, the trumpets, the bowls, the resistance from the dragon, the Antichrist, all of it. He's saying all of this, right? All that you've been seeing has one goal and that is to make all things new. And so he's like, Pay attention to what I'm doing in the midst of shaking. Pay attention to what I'm doing in the midst of tribulation. And I went into all of the, you know, tribulation, what that is, and, the, you know, everything over this last series that we're finishing up probably next week or the week after. But the thing is, is that we have to stay focused on what God is doing in those times, because if we don't, we're going to get distracted. Uh, like, if you look at uh, Hebrews chapter 12, the shaking that he promises is just that, a promise. And promises are good. So he's like shaking and tribulation and things like that may be difficult. But if you keep your eyes on him, it will feel far less scary than if you begin to focus on what the enemy is doing or if you begin to focus on the shaking. So when you interpret the book of Revelation, you always have to keep in mind it is a revelation of Jesus Christ, not the Antichrist, not the dragon, not what he's doing. It is a revelation of Jesus Christ and what God is doing, kicked off, by the way, from our prayers to restore everything back to its original glory. Okay? So we have to be really aware of where our attention is, especially during difficult times. So he's saying, pay attention to what I am doing. We must watch him. Uh, if we don't, we're going to get caught up in the distressing events and miss all uh, that is happening to bring an end to this age and bring the new end. And he makes it plain that those who will enjoy the blessings of the end are thirsty and victorious. He'll be our God, will be his children. Now, the word children here is huyos versus technon. And it only refers to mature people who are reverent, a disciple, a spiritual child of God, and, get this, derive his human nature directly from God and not by ordinary generation of Adam. So let me tell you, let me, let me read this again, because Jesus was never called a technon. A technon 
refers to like an infant or a small, small child that is not yet mature and we don't yet know how they're going to be. They may look physically like their parents. You might be able to start seeing some traits of the parents, but there's a lot that's still a mystery. But this word, huios, is referring to mature people that derive their nature directly from God and not by ordinary generation of Adam. In other words, we've been renewed. We have uh, arrived at the fullness of Christ. Love it. Then he says in verse 8, But cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and all liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Okay, so let's break down what each of these are. It'll be very important. So cowards are those that are fearful and timid. Timid. In some languages, it's one who always runs or one who runs away at nothing. Okay, so a coward is um, timid. A coward is fearful. They run away from distress and challenge versus running toward it. Now, this is important because he's saying cowards will not be allowed into the kingdom of God. And so we have to examine, are we bold? Are we willing to face difficulty? Are we willing to be brave, even though we know pain is certain or we know we're going to be very uncomfortable? These are questions to ask. And there's a, um, a place for making yourself uncomfortable on purpose. There's a place for not watching TV, even though you want to, and instead reading. There's a place for, you know, working on the yard, even though you have a huge blister and just keep going until, it, you know, it's done because... It's just something that needs to be done, right? It's, these are, you know, obviously self-care is important, but I, I feel that in society, we have gotten so comfortable with all of our modern amenities that it is crucial for believers to make themselves uncomfortable. Do the squats with the squat rack versus the leg press, right? Go to the gym versus not. I mean, there, there's so many things that we can do to make ourselves uncomfortable and it's important. So, Unbelievers are those who do not believe the good news about Jesus. Unbelief is the original sin. Corrupt means to be to cause to be abhorred, to turn uh, oneself away from a stench, to feel disgust, detest, and polluted with crimes. So people that are polluted with crimes will not enter. Murder is obvious, but we have to remember as Christians that even hating someone or hating our brother is considered murder uh, to the Lord or saying something that is hateful or hate-filled. Uh, immoral is a Greek word, pornos, where we get pornography. It means to sell like a male prostitute, a fornicator, one who engages in sexual immorality, whether a man or a woman. So this is the whole gamut of sexual sin. It's adultery. It's uh, sex outside of marriage. It's pornography. It's bestiality. It's homosexuality. It's lesbianism. It's like anything that is a sexual uh, perversion. So the only legal sex is within the context of marriage and within the boundaries of the word for our own good, right? And then witchcraft is one who uses magic and sorcery. What's interesting is that this word actually is pharmakeia in the Greek and is those dealing in drugs. That's literally what it means. So I'll just let you guys run with that as far as pharmakeia. Idol worship, you know, obviously a person who worships idol, by the way, covetousness, greed um, are considered idolatry to the Lord. Liars is one who utters lies, and it also means all those who contrive idolatrous worship and false miracles to deceive men and women and make them fall into idolatry. All right. Oh, I'm already turned. Okay, so verse 11. Then one of the seven angels who held the seven bowls containing the seven last pl plagues came and said to me, Come with me. I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. So he took me in the spirit to a great high mountain, and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and sparkled like a precious stone, like jasper as clear as crystal. The city wall was broad and high, with twelve gates guarded by twelve angels. And the name, names of the twelve tribes of Israel were written on the gates. There were three gates on each side, east, north, south, and west. The wall of the city had twelve foundation stones, and on them were written the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Okay, so the city's perfect. The, um, 
is a perfect cube, which is a, sim a, a symbolism for perfection. The pearl gates represent um, the pressure, the tribulation uh, that this city, the cost and the price that is paid uh, because, you know, they're only formed, pearls are only formed under irritation and pressure. Um, okay, so then the angel uh, taught, who talked to me held in his hand a gold measuring stick to measure the city, its gates and walls. When he measured, you know, it was found a, a, to be a perfect cube. The wall was made of jasper. The city was pure gold, as clear as glass. The wall of the city was built on foundation stones and laid with 12 precious stones. The first was jasper, then sapphire, a gate, emerald, onyx, carnelian, chrysolite, beryl, topaz, chrysoprase, uh, jacinth, and amethyst. The 12 gates were made of pearls, each from a single pearl, and the main street was uh, pure gold. Then it says in verse 22, I saw no temple in the city for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of sun or moon for the glory of God illuminates the city and the Lamb is its light. The nations will walk in this light and the kings of the world will enter the city in all their glory. Its gates will never be closed at the end of the day because there is no night there. And all the nations will bring their glory and honor into the city. Nothing evil will be allowed to enter nor anyone who practices shameful idolatry and dishonesty, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I love this. It reminds me again of this passage I've read in Isaiah 66, 22 through 24. And we'll end with this. As surely as my new heavens and earth will remain, I thought that was interesting, so will you always be my people with a name that will never disappear, says the Lord. All humanity will come to worship me from week to week and from month to month. And as they go out, they will see the dead bodies of those who have rebelled against me. For the womb, worms that devour them will never die, and the fire that burns them will never go out. All who pass by will view them with utter horror. So that was the, the Isaiah passage I was referring to earlier. Now, I want to... Um, real quickly point out something uh, in verse six that you might have missed or maybe you didn't where it says he also said it is finished very interesting you know because he said that at the cross so we're seeing his cry of it is finished it was not a uh, a one-time event when he spoke it, it is continuing to resound throughout earth and the heavens. So his words of it is finished will not be complete until this. Okay. So when we pray, when you think about the great apostolic prayers, like one of my favorites is Ephesians chapter three, pray the apostolic prayers, especially, uh, Pauls. I mean, they're incredible. Um, Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 3 have good ones. Colossians chapter 3, I believe, is another. But listen to this. Uh, this was one of his prayers. He said, I pray that he would unveil within you the unlimited riches of his glory and favor until supernatural strength floods your innermost being with his divine might and explosive power. Then, by constantly using your faith, the life of Christ will be released deep inside you and the resting place of his love will become the very source and root of your life. Then you will be empowered to discover what every Holy One experiences, the great magnitude of the astonishing love of Christ in all its dimensions, how deeply intimate and far reaching is his love, how enduring and inclusive it is, endless love beyond measurement that transcends our understanding. This extravagant love pours into you until you are filled to overflowing with the fullness of God. This prayer is still active in the earth. This prayer is still active in our lives. So when you take things that God spoke, when you take prayers that have been prayed by the apostles, by the Lord, when you join your agreement with them, they become real in your life. And not only that, you become the solution instead of a problem, right? So, when he said it is finished, it is not finished until God is dwelling among men. However, our salvation, the price paid, all of that, it's finished. 
So you have, like, what better way to learn to live in the it is finished than now? Understanding, like, um, I was judge, I was very judgy yesterday. And so when I got up this morning, I'm like, you know, I was very judgy toward that person. Like, like it's one thing to discern. It's one thing to, you know, pick up on some stuff. But it's another where, like, you're just being judgy and being a jerk. And it's not redemptive in any way. It's not a word. And so I was like, you know, Lord, I was judgy. And I don't like it. And I just want to tell you that and apologize to you. And I didn't tell. I wasn't judgy, like, in the person's face. But I knew I had, you know, I, he didn't like it. And, uh, and I, and I said, I repent. I, I changed my thinking and some of the words that I said kept coming back. And I said out loud, I thank you that because of your work, it's finished. And I trust the blood because if we're not, um, active and intentional on living in the, it is finished reality, we will continue to condemn ourselves and we'll continue to ruminate th about things we've done that they're already erased off of our account. So it's dumb. I mean, like, why would we want to think about a debt that we don't owe that's already been paid? Like, that doesn't make any sense. Why would we want to pay money toward a debt that doesn't exist, right? So we want to be careful because when we do those types of things, we're not trusting that it is finished. We're not trusting the blood. And we're trying to go into performance that if we make ourselves feel worse, then we can maybe somehow pay for what we did. And we should never do that. He made us unpunishable and he made us innocent, not just not guilty, right? So whenever you find that you do something, trust it is finished and trust the blood. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to take my accomplished self. So excited that I have figured out when to do this, guys. You have no idea. You have no idea how much. I was like, this is dumb. I've got to figure this out. So excited. Uh, now I just need to figure out when to teach the Constitution. That's another one that's been kind of like, I don't know where to put it. So if you guys would pray for me so I know where to put it, maybe once a month, maybe every two weeks. I don't know. But I definitely want to get that ball rolling. All right. Well, you guys have a great week, and I will see you next Monday.